All right, it's three o'clock, time to start. Hello everyone. I'm Glenn Ahrens, OSU Extension Forester for Clackamas, Marion, and Hitterer Counties. It's my pleasure to be your host today for Tree School Online. And Tree School Online is a production of the OSU Forestry and Natural Resources Extension Program and the Partnership for Forestry Education. We wanna give special recognition to the Oregon Forest Resources Institute for leading this project and to the US Forest Service and the Oregon Department of Forestry for giving us a grant to cover expenses. Tree School Online webinars are continuing every first and third Tuesday of the month through June, 2021. Also, I uh, wanna let you know there are our other series of forestry webinars. Uh, you can find them on our OSU Extension websites. And there's one coming up, uh, continuing the Eastern Oregon um, colleagues of mine are doing a Eastern Oregon Forest webinar. And there's one this Thursday and then two weeks uh, out. So Thursdays at 6 p.m. And you can find information about Tree School Online and other webinars at the knowyourforest.org website. Also got to talk about some housekeeping details with Zoom. Zoom toolbar, you should see the toolbar located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you don't see it, you can scroll the cursor over that area, it should pop up. Uh, and on some hardware, it might be on the top of the display uh, with the various features uh, on the toolbar. Your audio should be muted, is muted for participants. Um, and video is also not available for participants. For your questions, Q&A is very important uh, in these webinars and put your written questions in the Q&A box, uh, which you should see on your Zoom toolbar. And I will be monitoring this. And then uh, during the presentation if near the middle, a little ways through, we'll be having the Q&A session then and at the end. The chat uh, feature should only be used if you're having problems uh, and that will be monitored. Uh, our co-host, Julie Woodward uh, with Oregon Forest Resource Institute is uh, helping monitor the chat. Don't put questions in the chat, please. Uh, put those in the Q&A box so we can see that and I can discuss those with Charles. Uh, resources, so there will be a handout and other resources uh, from this and our other webinars that you'll be able to find in our Tree School Online class guide. Uh, those pages, you can be, you can reach those from the Tree School Online page at the knowyourforest.org site. Um, and you can click on the webinar description and then there'll be a drop down. You can look at some of the resources. This webinar will be recorded. Um, so you can go back and watch it again and you can tell others about it and they can go and find it and, and watch it after the fact should be available within a week or two. Um, polls, we're gonna have a, a brief poll at the beginning just to learn more about you, our audience, um, and a question from Charles about truffles. That will pop up on your screen and you should see the box and, and have a chance to answer the poll questions. It only takes a minute or so. Um, if you don't see the polls, you might check um, to see if you can make that box pop up uh, from the Zoom toolbar. I uh, have a, a disclaimer that the views and opinions expressed by our speakers are theirs and theirs alone and not those of OSU, uh, OFRI, or the Partnership for Forestry Education. So with that out of the way, it's my pleasure to introduce Charles Lefevre, Dr. Charles Lefevre, our, uh, our speaker today. So a little background, Charles, before I, I turn it over to you. Um, began his education in physics and chemistry, working in the nuclear field and with telescopes and black holes. But somewhere along the line, uh, he got um, brought over to the side of biology and was studying fungi at the University of Oregon, uh, the endophytes of Douglas fir, which is definitely a, a path leading towards truffles. Um, and then he did a PhD at Oregon State University in forest ecology, uh, studying associations with the matsutake mushroom. And in the, during that dissertation uh, or the PhD program, uh, someone asked him about tuber and inoculation of hazelnut seedlings. And thus was born uh, New World Truffiers and his business. And now he's our, one of our leading experts on truffles in Oregon. In 2006, um, Charles and his wife, Leslie, founded the Oregon Truffle Festival, which he'll tell you more about. Um, and I would say beyond Oregon, Charles, we see you as, a, as an expert. And, but of course, we're happy to have you here in Oregon uh, and the home of Douglas Fir, which you're going to talk about. So uh, go ahead, Charles, and, and let's get started. Thanks, Glenn. Um, and hi, everyone. It's I'm sad that I'm not there in person, you know, doing tree school as usual. It's an event I really enjoy. Uh, I think I've been doing it for close to 20 years, <laughs> giving more or less the same talk, but adding things to it as as we learn more. Um, so I'm very happy to contribute to this program. 
and delighted to see so many people in the room. Uh, so the talk, Diamonds Under the Douglas Fir. So uh, my company, New World Truffier, is uh, we specialize in inoculating seedlings of hazelnuts and various oaks and Douglas fir with all sorts of truffles. These trees are shipped all over the country and sometimes internationally. Uh, they're planted into orchards and they're growing truffles. Um, so that's one thing. The other is the Oregon Truffle Festival, which is uh, intended to celebrate our indigenous truffles. And that will be the focus of my talk here is our, our native truffles. All right, so, Charles, but, I'm going to start out with the poll. Um, oh, okay. And then we'll continue. So just so okay. you can get to know your, your audience a little better. So, sure. all right. So I, I'm going to launch the poll um, and it should show up. And we're just asking a bit about you, our audience, uh, where you're from, um, if you're a woodland owner or not. Um, so if you go ahead and start answering that, and we'll just spend a little less than a minute, I hope, on that. Let's see, Everybody, there it goes, okay. And then if you are a woodland owner or a forester, you know, how many acres are you managing? Um, and then Charles has a question about truffles. And this goes pretty quick, uh, usually end up with about 80% or so. And when we stop seeing responses come in, I'll draw it to a close and show the results. All right, a few more coming in. Okay, I think we're there, last call. All right, I'm gonna end the polling and share the results. Um, so right on the nose, two thirds of us are from the Willamette Valley area, uh, and then another 5% from the coast and 9% from Southwest Oregon, um, some Central Oregon, and a good number from Washington. 13%. As far as uh, we have one from outside the US too, and uh, some across the country. Uh, about half are woodland owners. Um, and then the other almost half uh, not woodland owners or forestry professionals just interested in learning about truffles, Charles. And as far as acreage goes amongst the, the woodland owners, uh, 10 to 40 acres is about a third. Um, and then half of the folks almost don't have acres, of course. Uh, some larger landowners in there as well. And the question, do you know if you have truffles on your land? And yes is 15% and no is 61%. 24% uh, say it doesn't apply, they don't have land. So there's a little glimpse of your audience, Charles. And then mm -hmm. I will, um, oh, I see I didn't even share the results. So you just heard me talking about it all that time. So I'm sorry about that. but. I did cover the basis. So uh, the bottom line is that a lot of the folks don't know about the truffles on their land and we're here to learn. That's great. Uh, so when I first started giving this talk, uh, practically no one in the audience had ever smelled or tasted a truffle. And now 15% of you know that you have truffles on your land and probably almost all of you have tasted or smelled a truffle. Things have really changed in the past 20 years. But for those of you who aren't familiar with what a truffle is, we're talking about mushrooms, not chocolate. And uh, the, the word truffle in the general sense is defined as a mushroom that depends on animals to disperse its spores and lacks the ability to forcibly discharge its spores into the air. Uh, there are many, many species of truffles. In the broad sense, there are maybe a thousand species here in North America. So uh, within that, I, I use the term culinary truffles, those truffles that, uh, have uh, recognized culinary and commercial value. And uh, we have many species that are actually quite good to eat, but of them only four are recognized. There's four in the Northwest and six altogether in North America uh, have recognized culinary and commercial values. Truffles have been famous celebrated delicacies for thousands of years. Most of them come from the wild, but a few are now widely and successfully cultivated on farms all around the world. And um, of course, they're among the world's most expensive foods. So this is a photo I took at the Alba Truffle Festival, I believe in 2014. And this price down on the bottom right hand 
the corner of the screen is about $2,600 a pound, which is kind of in the ballpark for, for Italian white truffles. Uh, and some of those truffles in that case are probably weigh an entire pound. <laughs> uh, the smallest of them is probably a quarter of a pound. So there's a fortune in that case. So what's their appeal? What, what's the big deal? Why would some people be willing to pay prices like this for a, for a mushroom? Uh, and I think the reason is that <laughs> they want us to eat them. They're, they're doing their best to make us want to eat them. Uh, so if you think about it from their perspective, they're trying to get some animal that's walking through the woods, busy doing something else, to stop what they're doing and come eat it. And you know the animal might not even be very close. It might be you know, 100 feet away. So how do they accomplish this? It's really kind of a, a difficult thing to do. When you, when you don't have legs, you can't make noise. <laughs> you have to produce an aroma so strong and so compelling that it will attract an animal's attention and get it to come and eat you. Um, and some of the truffles are, are very smart. They, <laughs> they, the aromas include things like thiols, which are things like rotten egg smell, um, that these uh, powerful aromas that, that our noses can detect in very, very low concentrations, but also androstenol, other musky compounds, things that can actually manipulate our behavior in very tiny quantities. And um, something that all these aroma compounds have in common is they're hydrophobic. They need to escape wet soil. Um, but that also informs how they're used because uh, hydrophobic aroma compounds will accumulate in foods that contain fat. The way truffles are found is with animals. So the most ancient method is to look for these flies that want to lay their eggs on the truffles. Uh, and then a more recent innovation was using pigs, which of course don't need to be trained. They automatically know that they want to eat a truffle. Um, but it's interesting, this photo of this pig, you know, this was at a conference of truffle researchers and practically none of them, including those from France, had ever seen a truffle pig working before. <laughs> so it's, it's not something that people do anymore. Um, you know, and the thing is, of course, truffle hunting is a secretive business. So if you're using a pig, everybody knows what you're doing. <laughs> and then, of course, you'd have to drive your pig around in a little French car. So uh, the most the modern methods are dogs, and people have developed gas detectors, like uh, the kinds of tools that find natural gas leaks. But a dog is just better at it because the dog really can find a truffle from a hundred feet away and run to it, uh, rather than using something like a metal detector having to sweep sweep the ground over that entire area. How are truffles used? Typically, they're shaved raw over foods that contain enough oil or fat to capture the aroma. Occasionally, they're cooked in the sauces and meats, but uh, the aromas are very volatile, and even a small amount of heat will cause a lot of it to dissipate. So unless there's a tremendous amount of fat or oil in that sauce, uh, you may lose a lot of the aroma. So uh, that's uh, something that people do more often with the less expensive truffles. And then there are myriad value-added products made by either infusing aroma into the truffles or actually incorporating truffles. And I'll talk about the aroma infusion later. So this talk is divided into two parts, the, the native Oregon truffles. And the second part is just kind of mentioning the fact that we are now growing European species here as well. So we kind of, we have it all. The Oregon truffles, Tuber oregonensi, the Oregon winter white truffle, Oregon spring white truffle, Oregon black truffle, and the Oregon brown truffle have Oregon black truffle in quotes because this species was originally described in France. Uh, but I haven't seen a comparison of the DNA between the European Lucangium carthusianum and the uh, Northwest Lucangium carthusianum. I suspect that they may not be this exactly the same thing considering that all truffles are dispersed by animals. So some animal would have, would have had to eat this truffle in France, across the Atlantic and then all of North America before it pooped in the woods. It seems unlikely. Um, it, interestingly, Tuber oregonensi and Calapuya brunea were just given their Latin names and described and published in 2010. And then elsewhere in North America, we have two other species, Tuber leonia, the pecan or Texas truffle, and Tuber caniliculatum, the uh, 
Appalachian or Michigan truffle. The winter white truffles, Tuber oregonensi. These are some very nice specimens. This is that was about as big as they typically get. Uh, it has a very solventy kind of aroma uh, that I think is beautiful. This is really one of my favorite truffles. Spring white truffle, Tuber jibosum. It's a very similar species. It just fruits at a different time of year, and it actually does have quite a different aroma, which is hard to describe. It has like maybe a seafood element among the solventy quality. The Oregon black truffles, um, as one of my colleagues described them, it looks like this looks like a dog's nose. <laughs> uh, this truffle is gorgeous. It ha has an aroma of tropical fruit, pineapple, strawberry. It's just just lovely. And then as it matures. It'll develop, it will develop more savory notes of uh, cheeses and chocolate and things like that. Just wonderful. And then the Oregon brown truffle next to a black truffle, just to show kind of how similar they are. The brown truffle has an aroma of cooked cauliflower. And, and typically the aroma of the truffle is the same as the taste. In this case, it may be a little different. Uh, my experience of brown truffles is it's, it's very truffly and very nice. Uh, and Interestingly, in, in our, the blind taste tests we've done over the years, the brown truffles, whenever they have been in the mix, have won the taste test. They're, they're always rare, though, and they're typically found as bycatch along with the Oregon black truffles. Then the others, Tubulionii, the pecan truffle. Um, its geographic ranges from northern Mexico all the way up into the Great Lakes region throughout the entire eastern third of the continent. It's a vast geographic range, but it's likely that this species will eventually be split into Tuber leonia and Tuber texensi. Uh, the, uh, the Tuber texensi variety maybe <laughs> is uh, often found in tremendous abundance in pecan orchards, hence the name pecan truffle. And it's a, it's a situation where these truffles are thriving in a very intensively managed environment that's fertilized and irrigated and mowed and sprayed with chemicals. Um, and the truffles thrive in that kind of anthropogenic environment. So it's, that's definitely a, a species that we can grow. In fact, it's fruiting as a contaminant in many of my customers' orchards um, that are planted in its native habitat. Tuber canaliculatum is a species that's very hard to obtain. There are just a few people in North America harvesting it. Uh, uh, I do have some show and tell here today, which is a little bowl of tuber canaliculatum <laughs> that just arrived FedEx minutes ago. I was expecting my dogs to explode barking at the FedEx guy during my talk, <laughs> but hopefully the truffle, or thankfully the truffles arrived in time. Uh, the tuber de Leon, Leon, Leonia has a, an aroma of kind of um, kind of like malt balls, a very kind of pleasant aroma. The tuber canaliculatum has a more interesting nuanced aroma that's it's the most like the Italian white truffle of any of our North American species. Its aroma is not that intense, but it has that sort of garlicky quality. And this is where these truffles live. So uh, tuber organensi. It's found in Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. Tuber jubosum is found all the way down from the Bay Area, a couple of collections in Marin County, all the way also into southern British Columbia. Lucangium carthusianum has a similar range from the Bay Area, Point Reyes National Seashore, up into British Columbia. And the Oregon brown truffle is found from extreme northern California through the rest of Oregon doesn't appear that there are any collections in Washington. Uh, you'll notice, particularly with the black truffle and the brown truffle, that there is a concentration around the town of Corvallis. And that's undoubtedly an artifact of having such a high population of truffle mycologists there. <laughs> it's probably the most studied uh, truffle flora of any place on the continent. Uh, you'll notice there with the tuber canaliculatum, in northern Michigan and in Quebec, there are two concentrations. <laughs> I suspect there's a university involved there as well. And the same with Tuber uh, One thing to point out, our native Oregon truffles are found strictly on the west side of the Cascades under the, uh, the, the west side 
variety of Douglas fir. So given that there are truffles all over the continent, why has Oregon become this place that uh, is recognized for its truffle industry, um, that's um, recognized globally for its truffle industry, and it's flourished where the truffle industries elsewhere in the country are only just beginning. They're really just a handful of harvesters. And I think it has a lot to do with, with the fact that at Oregon State University over the past century, there have been a, there's been a lineage of truffle biologists, uh, um, and one of whom, Dr. James Trappy, Jim Trappy, has had a tremendous number of graduate students and postdocs and has had a tremendous influence. And I suspect, he's never said this, but I suspect he's the one who pointed out originally to some uh, mushroom harvester that, you know, these Oregon truffles really could be quite good. <laughs> Jim spent some time in Italy uh, um, on a sabbatical, so he got to know truffles there. So when he's harvesting these truffles here, he's thinking these are pretty good. And um, that happened probably sometime in the mid-1970s, and it just happened that in 1976, there was a conference in Corvallis called the Mushrooms and Man Conference. James Beard was one of the uh, one of the speakers, who's James Beard is one North America, the United States most famous chef. Uh, and he proclaimed that Oregon white truffles are every bit as good as Italian white truffles. And everybody selling Oregon truffles since then has, has <laughs> used that quote to promote our native truffles. The, the fact that we have four species all living together um, and fruiting in really great abundance helps a lot. But it also helps that there was an already established mushroom harvest industry. So when truffles came along, it was a simple thing for the, those buyers and those distributors and those brokers to just add another product to the things they were already selling. You know, we harvest tremendous amounts of matsutake and porcini and morels and chanterelles here. Uh, so truffles were just one more thing, it made it easy. Whereas in the Southeast or in the Appalachians, they're, they're having to put this all together from scratch. The harvest seasons, the winter white truffle, uh, I've seen it as early as September and as late as April, but most of them ripen between January and March. It depends somewhat on the season. So last year we had really early frost in October and the, season, the overall season was much earlier. We started seeing truffles at Thanksgiving. But for the festival, often uh, we don't see good truffles in any abundance until mid to late January. And then they will often continue all the way through March. Spring lights are, are May through July, depending on the weather. If it gets dry soon enough, then the, the, the crop may stop fruiting in June. But some years they'll continue fruiting all the way through the end of July. The Oregon black truffle fruits year round, we can always find a few, but they are most abundant October through May. And then in my opinion, the quality is the best in April and May, um, which is an interesting fact considering uh, that typically the harvest is done by the end of January. The Oregon brown truffle also appears to fruit year round. It's always rare, except I've seen a lot of collections come in during the month of September when we're not really looking for the other species. So it may be that the peak of production for the brown truffles is in late summer. So years ago, when I was in graduate school and I first started making my living uh, working with the European truffles, I was out harvesting the native Oregon truffles kind of recreationally, maybe trading them to restaurants for meals. Um, but I had, you know, I had them in the refrigerator side by side many, many times. So here is a photo of my refrigerator with a little bowl of Oregon black truffles and an enormous bag of Italian white truffles. And I had done some research interviewing harvesters and buyers and chefs for a talk that I gave in France in 1999, I believe. And there was a consensus among all of these people that our native Oregon truffles are sort of, sort of an inexpensive substitute for the real thing, um, that they're not nearly as good and they really don't compare in a culinary sense. But my experience in my own refrigerator was completely different, where often when we opened the refrigerator, the, the aroma that filled the room was that of Oregon truffles, even though there were often larger volumes of European truffles there with them. So it was clear right away that the reputation and price of the Oregon truffles did not reflect their real value. 
Um, and it, it struck me that there was an opportunity to redeem these species, to kind of lift them in the, to, into the pantheon of culinary delicacies. So long ago, we began doing taste tests. Um, so for the past 20 years, we've been doing these taste tests every time we get an opportunity, comparing whatever truffles, fresh truffles we have at the time. And many of these taste tests have been done at the Mount Pisgah Mushroom Show, which takes place at the end of October each year. And uh, we'll get a couple of hundred or 300 participants to come and sniff these truffles and tell us which of them they prefer. And then we tell them what the truffles are. Um, so in 2014, we had 319 participants, nine people were undecided, 14 to expressed some knowledge of truffles, and I so I disqualified them. I didn't count their opinions because people tend to tend to develop uh, preferences very quickly. So I, I didn't want people who had established preferences to participate in this. So I disqualified all those people who expressed knowledge. Uh, and that year we had the Italian white truffle, the, the most expensive of them all, the Oregon black, the Oregon white, the pecan truffle, and tuberstevum is the burgundy truffle, which is also from Europe. And you can see the results. The uh, famous Italian white truffle gets 75 votes. The Oregon black truffle gets 82 votes. The Oregon white, 75. And then the other two are distant fourth and fifth. In 2018, similar results. Um, the Italian white gets 46 votes. The Oregon black gets 44. And two, the Oregon white gets 63. These results have never varied. We've always seen exactly the same thing, where the Oregon truffles uh, score on par with, or maybe slightly better than, their European cousins. And I would not call this a rigorous taste test. Uh, we were unable to control for the age and the storage methods and all of that. But I can say uh, that in October, the Oregon truffles are really at their worst in the year. And um, you know, like the Oregon white truffles typically are only ripening because they've been damaged by bugs or something. So they're ripening prematurely. Um, so, and then of course the Italian and all the European truffles are probably more than a week old. They've spent a lot of time in transit. So it would be hard to do this kind of taste test in a rigorous way, but those, Italian white truffles that are a week old still cost $2,000. <laughs> so there's just no question that uh, for, based on these results, I think the conclusion we can make is that the Oregon truffles are better than their historic price and reputation suggests. I, I would never assert from this data that these data that uh, Oregon truffles are better than the European species. I, I think it does make an argument that truffles are the kind of thing that the best experience if you travel to them rather than having them shipped to you. But this also supported the notion that there's a possibility we could redeem the reputation of these native truffles. But there are problems. And this is an, the best example that sums it up. This was a batch of truffles I found at Central Market in Seattle years ago. And Central Market is just the best grocery store you'll ever see. The produce section is the size of a Safeway store with everything. <laughs> it's just remarkable. And it's the kind of grocery store where you would expect to find truffles for sale. Uh, and so I saw this and just couldn't believe it. There, <laughs> uh, I'll just list the problems. First, those white things are grains of rice. Uh, you can use those for scale. But also, I knew from experience that when you put truffles in rice, it sucks the life out of them. It kills them. It, it makes them, um, it causes them to wilt. And the, and the aroma changes. So if you hear people describe the smell of truffles as nutty, it's typically because the truffles are just dehydrated dried mushrooms. Uh, so storing them in rice is a bad way to do it. It dehydrates the truffle very quickly. Second problem is these truffles are tiny. <laughs> they're, they're pathetic, embarrassing things. Uh, truffles like this should have been you know, sent off to, a, you know, these would be seconds that are included in value added products. They're not the kind of handsome truffles that you want to sell fresh. Third thing is the price, which is, uh, I can see it here, $98 per pound, which makes puts these squarely as among the least valuable truffles on the planet. <laughs> and then finally, these truffles are kind of shiny. It's because they are completely rotten, every single one of them. And every box there looked like this. Oh, there's one other problem. It says these are black truffles and they're not, they're white truffles. 
Uh, so I, I told the staff there, and to their credit, they promptly threw them all away. But I took this one out and bought it <laughs> just, just to take this photo. And this, so this exemplifies the problem. It's like even the best grocery store around has no idea what they're dealing with with these truffles. Nor does nor do any of the chefs. Um, they're, they're, you know, it's just an enormous learning curve. And um, it struck me that the fundamental problem, in addition to the lack of knowledge on the part of people using the truffles, the fundamental problem is the way they were being harvested. So a truffle is it doesn't produce any aroma until it's actually ripe. Its spores are mature and ready to germinate. So it doesn't want to be found until the spores are ready. So it produces no aroma at all. So an immature truffle or an unripe truffle really has no culinary value. The problem is that a truffle develops very slowly. The, say using the Oregon winter white truffles as an example, they reach full size sometime in October, typically the middle of October, but they don't start ripening often until January. And some of them don't ripen until March. So, um, but the peak demand for truffles of all kinds is before the holidays between Thanksgiving and New Year's. So historically, because our native truffles were harvested with rakes, nearly all of them were harvested immature when they had no culinary value. So uh, raking damages quality in two ways, the inability to selectively har harvest ripe truffles, and then that com uh, commercial incentive to harvest early. There's also this competitive incentive to harvest early in the sense that if multiple people are aware of the same truffle patch, the anyone, only one who gets any truffles is the first person who goes there. So it creates an incentive to get there sooner. Whereas, uh, oh, I'll talk about dogs later. So raking produces mostly immature truffles. I do want to say that the reason people here in Oregon raked for truffles is just because that's how the researchers who discovered all these species in the first place uh, did the surveys that found the truffles. So the early harvesters just continued using the methods the researchers had. Uh, so I'm not, it, <laughs> I don't want to imply that people who use rakes are bad people. I do think that raking uh, does harm the reputation of the truffles though, and that there's a much better way to do it. Also, I, I just want to show this incredible phenomenon. Here, this this guy um, and my friend John Getz, who uh, who's a very famous uh, matsutake picker. Matsutake, when they're at their most valuable, are underground, and often they're invisible. But these guys develop X-ray vision; they can just see mushrooms underground, and they adapted that to finding truffles. So he's convinced there are two truffles right there, and he's pointing at the ground, and he knows there's a truffle there. <laughs> to my eye, there's just really nothing. <laughs> but sure enough, there's a truffle. Um, and they can do this all day long, which was m m much less destructive than raking, but it had the same problem. This bumped picking technique has the same problem that uh, the truffles are being harvested, uh, regardless of their maturity. So many of them are, are immature. Also, notice how smooth and undisturbed the ground is. This is the same site a few years later when a few rakers found it. And what has happened here is this five acre area is being raked to a depth of about 14 inches every single year. It doesn't happen all at once though. They come through, get the top say four or five inches. And when they there's nothing left to harvest there, they come back again and go deeper and again. Uh, sometimes you can actually see light underneath the, the main roots of these trees, which is something that should never happen. This is tremendously destructive to, to soil structure. Um, it's undoubtedly causing aroma, er, erosion. It's resetting ecological succession in these stands. These are just young stands that are growing on farmland for the most part. Um, so this isn't terribly different than the kind of tilling that happened prior to that. But still, this is, this is not a pleasant site. And then another problem with raking is that there's overlap in the seasons of the spring white truffles and the winter white truffles. So the spring white truffles begin developing in the soil at some point during the month of January. And they're, they're really living intermingled with each other. So if you're looking for the winter white truffles, you're often collecting spring white truffles along with them that have no culinary value at that stage. They're months immature. So they represent a, effectively a contaminant among the winter white truffles and you're destro destroying the spring truffle crop. 
So uh, it's, it's destructive in this way too. The solution is very simple though, just dogs. Do it the way the Europeans do. The dog's role is just to find the ripe truffles. So it's, it's really doing a kind of a primary quality control screening on the truffle batch. It's also much, much easier. Imagine how much it would cost to pay a landscaper to rake five acres to a depth of 14 inches. <laughs> Where a truffle dog, you just go, you have to go back repeatedly. The dog finds what's ripe and leaves everything else in the ground to continue ripening. Uh, it also has, because it's easier, because the dogs can find a truffle from 100 feet away, uh, it makes it possible to find truffles in places where there are a lot fewer of them and it wouldn't be, couldn't uh, make a living harvesting truffles with a rake. Uh, so it expands the potential suitable habitat and then also expands the season into the margins where. Uh, the, the rakers would have given up, but we can go out and still find truffles. And that's how we know that there are Oregon black truffles year round. Um, so it just makes it all dramatically easier. It does a lot less soil disturbance. And the dogs are fantastic ambassadors for our truffle industry. The, the media loves them. So it, it, where raking kind of gave our industry a black eye, the dogs are huge promoters of the Oregon truffle industry. Training them is very easy. Um, if, in this photo, there are actually two dogs. There's one in the background to the right. That I trained that dog myself, and he he had it within a few minutes. He got it, and I was just using Q-tips of truffle oil in my backyard, and I didn't make it hard. I just held them up to his nose, and when he sniffed it, I gave him treats, lots and lots of treats, and I was really happy. Uh, and then I put it on the ground and sort of led him over to it, and more treats, and he got it. But he went. I had a dozen of them scattered around my yard. And by the end of 10 minutes, he had, he had gone and found them all on his own. I did that four times in the yard before taking him into the field. And he was, he was working. He was 12 weeks old when I first took him in the field and he was finding truffles right off the bat. <laughs> Just amazing. Um, and then there's one other thing to mention with the black truffles in particular, just as when we rake the winter whites, we destroy the spring white crop. When we rake the black truffles, we're actually destroying multiple future flushes. So black truffles come in waves over the course of the season. And uh, if you rake them up before the holidays, uh, you're just getting the first flush. There are two or three more that you could have harvested if you had just used the dog. So using a dog will tend to increase the productivity of your site dramatically over the course of the year. Uh, prices. So I include this slide just to make the point that uh, the French truffles and the European truffles in general are never harvested any other way than with dogs. But in Oregon, I would say the majority of Oregon truffles are still harvested with rakes. And but there are a few people who are harvesting and selling truffles with dogs. And the, what we've seen over the years is that the prices have bifurcated, where uh, the rake truffle prices are still among the least expensive in, in the world, where with dogs, our truffles are now up there with the most expensive truffles in the world. Uh, it, I think just this, this year, for the first time, I was selling Oregon truffles for prices higher than I was paying for imported French truffles. So, which is to say, by introducing dogs, we've succeeded <laughs> in making these truffles more valuable. So where to find these Oregon truffles? The answer is nearly everywhere that the coastal variety of Douglas fir grows. That's in town, it's at high elevations, it's at sea level, anywhere there are Douglas fir, the coastal variety. And I suspect where we, there are specimens collected from uh, most of the geographic range of the coastal variety of Douglas fir. And it wouldn't surprise me to find that, that these truffles live throughout that geographic range from central California all the way up into BC. The highest productivity is in young stands and planted on farmland. So this is a, very much like uh, the European species and the pecan truffles. These truffles thrive in human modified environments. They're, they're very sort of weedy in that sense. They thrive in anthropogenic habitats and they are very much the kind of thing that we should be able to grow. And they, uh, 
<laughs> my one discovery when I finally had a truffle dog was that there are truffles and the, the, the closest Douglas fir to my house. Um, we were finding spring white truffles just 200 feet away. So these truffles are really sort of ubiquitous wherever there's Douglas fir. Um, the classic habitat, and this is an Oregon white truffle patch, uh, is Douglas fir planted on pasture or farmland between the ages of 15 and 30 years old with older trees immediately nearby. The, and, and often this setting is in somebody's backyard. <laughs> uh, so the land use history is, is a critical factor determining whether or not there will be any abundance of truffles. The truffle spores be, uh, came from those older trees. They traveled just as far as a mouse that ate them could go. Uh, uh, so the tree, preferably those older trees are uphill at the top of the patch. Um, so I had been driving down the highway and saw this and it just struck me as the definition of truffle habitat. And I took this photograph before I ever went there. When I did finally go there, uh, it was completely loaded with truffles and that place became what I started to call the festival patch. And we've probably taken a thousand people there now uh, to go on truffle hunting excursions. And it's supplied unbelievable volumes of truffles for the Oregon Truffle Festival over the years. There were, there were times when I would fill a five gallon bucket with white truffles. So truffles thrive on afforested farmland. Uh, this, these photos were taken by Jim Trappy many years ago. Uh, the case was the Christmas tree farmer in November, he's harvesting his Christmas trees, but he's kicking up the duff and finding these, these mushrooms under his trees. And he's probably thinking, oh great, what's growing on my trees now? Takes them to the extension service. They refer him to the forest mycology group uh, in the Department of Forestry at OSU. Uh, and the forest mycology group says, we've got to go see this. <laughs> and this the photo at the bottom of those four truffles, are, those are just as big as Oregon white truffles get. And these are under eight year old Christmas trees. So there's, there's no question that this is a set of conditions that we can emulate deliberately. Uh, nobody has yet, but it's something we can do. And then this is a black truffle patch in the coast range. And you can see there are no stumps or logs. There are no legacies of a previous forest because this was pasture land before him. And it, it's very likely where I said 15 to 30 years, you know, we can find them on younger trees and we often find them on older trees. But it, it's very likely that uh, the quality of stand management will influence how long the truffles root in a patch. So for example, in a stand like this, where the crown ratio say there's only maybe 30% of the top of the tree that has life branches, um, I would expect to see the truffles sort of disappear in the near future if this stand is not thinned. But if it is thinned, I would expect truffle production to last for decades longer. And here's the end of the last day of the season when the, we weren't finding enough truffles to make it worth continuing. They, we got six pounds in, in about three hours. And finally, permits. Um, there is almost no public land where truffle hunting is permitted. Not, no, the USDA Forest Service does not allow truffle hunting in any of the Northwest forests. There are two districts of the BLM, the Eugene and uh, Spring, or Salem districts that do offer uh, some permits. Uh, but, you know, it just happens that nearly all of the good habitat is on private land. But even there, the State Department of Forestry requires you to have a permit from the landowner and to show a chain of custody when you're, um, when you're transporting truffles. So definitely get permits. This is not, this is not a minor offense. Uh, there are a couple of well-known harvesters who have spent time in jail for poaching truffles. Um, so it's definitely something you don't want to do. So that's the end of part one. Um, and I welcome your questions. It looks like there are quite a few. Yes, there are. Very good. Thank you, Charles. Um, so we'll get started on the questions. And um, starting off, um, you, you mentioned your dogs. And there was a question, are they Legotos? They are Legotos. Ah, so somebody had a discerning eye and suspected as much. <laughs> Uh, well, there's a related question. Um, so what breeds of dogs uh, are good for truffle hunting? Any breed? 
You know, uh, I'll mention later in the talk of the jury ad, the uh, North American Truffle Dog Championship. And there's always been a legato in the finalists and legatos are the only breed that has been bred specifically for truffle hunting. But a legato has never won the event and practically every other kind of dog has. <laughs> so including a Chihuahua mix a few years ago. So yes, any kind of dog can do it, but not every individual dog is good at it, even if it's a legato. Okay. And uh, what's the spelling of legato? L-A-G-O-T-T-O. Okay, thank you. Um, what is the marbling in truffles? Why is it there? Um, oh, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if you can see this. Here's the interior of a truffle and there's this white marbling. The difference is that the dark color is the spores themselves. The spores uh, accumulate tannins to make them durable as they pass through the gut of an animal. The white is the kind of the vegetative structures that produce all those spores. So all, all, all of the truffles have some kind of marbling or other. Very good, thanks. Um, does it matter what type of truffle oil is used when you're training a dog to find truffles? Uh, I don't think it does. In fact, one of the speakers at the Truffle Festival referring to synthetic truffle oil um, said that training dogs was its highest, best use. <laughs> uh, dogs have the ability to, um, some have the ability to generalize among aromas. So you teach them on one truffle and they automatically find any kind of truffle. Uh, but it's also very easy to teach them to switch aromas. So really, you just need to teach them the trick, and you can use any kind of aroma to do that. You could use essential oils of some plant, and it wouldn't matter. You're just teaching them the trick, and then you just switch to different aromas when you want them to find something else. And you can also teach dogs not to find things that you don't want them to find. Uh, with my dogs, I, he, he was finding those black and yellow millipedes that are so common in our woods and that produce cyanide when you bother them. Uh, he kept finding those. And so I just held one up in my hand and just went, oh, and he never found one again. <laughs> <laughs> the whole process is really very easy. All right. Um, and yeah, somebody else had asked about, uh, she missed the part about how you trained your dog. Uh, so you might just quickly say how you train a dog because it was pretty quick and easy. Oh yeah, just uh, putting truffle oil on Q-tips. I just scattered them around the yard. I didn't hide them at all. Uh, and just held the Q-tip up, kept one, scattered 11 of them around, held one in my hand and let the dog sniff it. And when he did, I gave him treats and praised him and had a big party that went on and on and on, like giving him really a lot of treats, like orders of magnitude more treats than he would get for doing any other trick. Um, and, you know, of course, orders of magnitude happier too. That, so the rule of thumb is if your friends or your neighbors are not embarrassed for you, then you're not happy enough. <laughs> uh, then put it on the ground, led the dog over to it, same thing, big party, lots of treats, um, and then led him over to a, a Q-tip that had been there for a few minutes. And by the end of just a few minutes, he understood what we were doing and was off doing it on his own. And I just did that four times in the yard before taking him into the field where he promptly started to find truffles. So it was really a very easy process. Not all dogs are going to be that easy. Like, for example, many dogs will be distracted by other animal smells or just smells in general in the woods. Um, some dogs are just not that motivated. They don't want the treats that much or the praise. Uh, some dogs, the best way to train them was with a ball or a toy. Uh, so each dog is a little different and it won't always be as easy as I've experienced. Um, and often it's helpful to get a help from a professional to help deal with some of the idiots and of your individual dog. Right. Imagine you might say more about that when you talk about the Truffle Festival. Um, so lots of questions are coming in. So can you over harvest an area? Oh, presumably if you were to harvest all of the truffles and never return another spore to the ground, uh, uh, you would prevent the truffles from reproducing. But the truffles are perennial organisms that can produce truffles for for decades in the same place. Uh, they're kind of like apples on an apple tree. Uh, and this is true of all, all mushrooms. The likelihood though is that the substantial part of the crop is, is getting away from you. The animals are eating them as they ripen. 
Uh, so lots of spores are being spread. I don't worry about over harvesting. Unless you entirely rake five acres to 14 inches, that might be a little bit overdoing it. Interestingly, right? they know they come back and they do it year after year. These, oh, these organisms are early successional. They, they, they live in these sort of um, early successional environments and the process of raking kind of resets succession. Oh. So, so it's, it's clear that you can get truffles uh, year after year despite raking. Wow. So uh, what do wildfires do? Uh, how do they affect truffles? Well, by killing the host tree, they've, you're killing the truffle. Uh, so if the host trees are dead, then the truffles are also dead. Interestingly, though, some of the best Oregon black truffle habitat in Western Oregon is on sites that were burned, like the Tillamook, Tillamook burn historically had a lot of Oregon black truffles. And the woods around the town of Burntwoods historically had a lot of truffles. Those, those stands of trees have now sort of aged out of it. But um, it's possible that truffles you know, thrive in a sort of grassland ecology and that by rendering a lot of the woody material inert by coating it with charcoal, you're creating the kind of biological environment where the truffles can thrive. So it may be that while the trees being killed des destroys the truffle crop, the, you know, all that charcoal in the soil may be creating conditions where truffles will thrive in the future. When the forest comes back. Exactly. Yeah. Um, much has been made of the relationship between northern flying squirrels and truffles in old growth forests. Uh, is this still true in these younger stands of Douglas fir? What's the relationship with the squirrels? Uh, the, the, these truffles that we are looking for are, are very desirable to squirrels. So you, in fact, that's another way to harvest truffles is to just to look for places where squirrels and mice have dug holes. Often the truffle is bigger than the animal that's trying to eat it. So there's some of it left in the hole. Uh, so there's, there's no doubt that uh, these are valuable. Um, and I would say it's likely that many of the same animals that are eating truffles in the old growth forests, uh, those, those that can live in younger forests are also eating them. These truffles don't tend to be very common in old growth though. You, you do find them, but not in any abundance. Um, so I don't think there's a conservation issue there where we're harming old growth dependent species. Yeah, so the culinary truffles tend to be in the younger stands, even though there's yeah. many other truffles in the old growth forest. Right, yeah. Okay, do and you, if, need, a, if, do you if, need a permit um, to hunt truffles on your own land? Uh, you need to show it sort of a chain of custody. You need to be able to say where the truffles came from. The, the, the rules are pretty clear about that in the, uh, so like if the sheriff stopped you and you have a car full of truffles uh, and they ask you, where'd you get these? <laughs> you need to be able to dem demonstrate where they came from. So you have to write yourself a permit for harvesting. Uh, essentially, truffles. yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and then when, when we sell truffles, uh, we give people a receipt so that if, if the sheriff stops them, they have a receipt to show where they got them. Is it legal to hunt truffles on public land for personal non-commercial use? I think that I have not seen the rules recently, but when I did, it, it, it appeared that the truffle harvesting was uh, not allowed under any circumstances. Okay. And the fundamental problem is that even if you're using a dog, it is still a soil disturbance. And uh, the federal agencies have to take that very seriously. Um, so the fact that the BLM is able to issue permits is because they were, they were able to tack truffle hunting onto another an existing environmental impact statement. Otherwise, if they were to allow truffle harvesting elsewhere, they'd have to write up a separate environmental impact statement. All right. Why there's lots of questions still coming. Um, is, there, <laughs> is there a list of private landowners that allows people to hunt on their land? No, there isn't. And in fact, many of the timber companies don't want mushroom pickers of any kind on their land. And it's a uh, part of it may be that they just don't want those people on their land, uh, but it may also be a liability issue. I was just talking to a uh, forester, one of the medium-sized timber companies a few days ago, and he said for them, it was a, a liability issue. They didn't want to be blamed for somebody eating the wrong kind of mushroom that came from their land. Okay. So things I like, I don't believe that Weyerhaeuser allows mushroom harvesting on any of their lands. And I think it's the, only the unusual timber companies that do allow. 
mushroom harvesting. Yeah. So it sounds overall like it's pretty closely scrutinized and <clears throat> landowners need to give themselves permits and give permits to others that come. And of course, you have to always check before you want to hunt truffles on someone else's land. Um, is the price for rake versus dog harvested truffles, is that just because you find more truffles or is there less damage to truffles? Uh, what explains that difference? You know, the difference in quality is obvious to anyone. The, the uh, dog harvested truffles are all uniformly ripe, where the rake truffles are mostly unripe. So there's orders of magnitude differences in the intensity and quality of the aroma. Uh, so it's, the difference in price is because the truffles are so much better. Okay. Uh, what's an appropriate way to get permits from private landowners? Kind of oh, that's, that's not difficult. Um, it, well, I mean, if you know somebody who has truffles, or if somebody approaches you and wants to harvest the truffles you have, uh, the permit is pretty simple, really. It's uh, showing, it states where, where the property is, who the landowners are, their contact information, who the harvester is. Um, just uh, the information that's necessary for the, the sheriff or whomever to trace those truffles to their origin and make sure they're legit. It's the same permit you need to gather firewood or pick salal greens. Uh, and it makes perfect sense to me that <laughs> a permit should be required. Okay. Um, are schnauzers known to be good at truffle hunting? Uh, I have known schnauzers to hunt truffles. I do think they could be good. They're certainly high energy dogs. All right. Um, <laughs> I have nine acres of overgrown Christmas trees. Are they a coastal variety? Uh, the soil is very dry in the summer. Can I still find truffles under them? Uh, should I irrigate? Uh, so someone's looking at cultivating under Christmas yeah. trees. So I gave a, a, another tree school talk that's available online talking about what you might do to manage a truffle crop in your land, an uh, Oregon truffle crop. Um, so the questions I would have right off the bat are how densely packed are the trees? If, if if they were literally planted as Christmas trees and they're overgrown, it's likely that the, they're overcrowded and spindly, in which case I, I would expect the truffles have already disappeared. But if they're, say, only 10 years old and they're not yet um, overcrowded, you could have a phenomenally good truffle patch. Uh, right. so the best truffle handling I've ever seen was under 10-year-old Christmas trees. Yeah, and related, uh, someone's asking about truffles under filbert trees. Um, Sure. And that's another topic, of course, you. Uh, let me circle, complete the last question. And that is, uh, I'll give you my contact information at the end of this talk. You, any of you, you're welcome to contact me to ask additional questions that come up. But also, uh, we can arrange, I can refer you to somebody to do a survey of your land to see whether or not you have truffles. Excellent. Okay. Um, I suppose we should give you a chance to finish your presentation. How much more time do you have in uh, your slides, do you think? Oh, you know, <laughs> I can make it as short or as long as, as you like. But okay, I, let's do I a think... couple more then. Okay. Because there's still 22 in the queue here. Um, <laughs> uh, is there a best time of year to take a newly trained dog out for the best chance of finding the truffles? Um, yes. Uh, so peak season, for the white truffles would be, uh, say, just the month of February. That would be that's a great time to take your dog out. Both the winter white and the black truffles are sort of at their peak at that time of year. All right. Um, are there any poisonous lookalikes? Uh, there are no truffles in the strict sense that are known to be toxic. That doesn't mean that there aren't some, but none are known to be. Uh, there's always the possibility of allergies to fungi that are otherwise edible. Um, then there are things that look like truffles that are toxic, that they're not truffles, but they do look like them. So in particular, there's a kind of puffball called a scleroderma that when you cut it open, the interior is purple. And, uh, and, and as it matures, it becomes a powdery brown. That will make you sick. And it's very, very common and abundant, particularly under hazelnut trees as, as it happens. Um, and then certain toxic mushrooms, when they're very young, look like a puffball. They're just sort of a globe on the ground. But if you cut them open vertically, you can see the shape of a mushroom inside. Okay. And it's somewhat related. Um, 
are there a lot of highly fragrant false truffles in Oregon? Um, this person says they found some that they don't match any identification of the edible truffles, but they're very pungent. Uh, so there, what there are hundreds of species of truffles, and I don't there's so there's terminology that I don't tend to use, which is true truffles and false truffles. And those terms are defined in various ways, and I, I don't think it's helpful. But um, typically, false truffle refers to basidiomycetes, where true truffle refers to ascomycetes. So different lineages of fungi. Many of the basidiomycete truffles are very good to eat. They have wonderful, amazing aromas. There's one in particular that I think is gorgeous. It's a Leucogaster citrinum. It's a bright lemon yellow truffle. It's very common, widespread. Its aroma is just juicy fruit gum, just gorgeous. <laughs> and it's not recognized to have culinary and commercial value, even though I think it probably does have culinary value. So yes, there, there are a lot of truffles that are very fragrant. Uh, do you find Oregon black truffles in older growth uh, with large Douglas fir trees? Uh, yes, <laughs> it's, ne it's never common. Um, and really where you're more likely to find truffles is on the side of logging roads uh, rather than out in the forest in the duff. Uh, so you may, if, if, you, if there's a logging road, gravel road, that's sort of a little bit overgrown running through old growth. Yeah, you can find truffles on the margins in the gravel. Okay. Um, won't the dogs dig up the truffle and ruin it? And if so, how do you train the dog not to do that? <laughs> That's a great question. And it's true. In fact, uh, my dogs love to eat truffles. They eat more truffles than any human being I know. Uh, so <laughs> when I'm working both dogs and they both find a truffle simultaneously, one or the other of them is going to get to eat it. <laughs> but, but, you know, I don't mind because the, there are so many truffles that I'm just, I'm working as fast as I can. And if they get to eat some, that's fine. In fact, uh, I, they eat a lot of truffles. Um, but, and they do scratch the truffles and damage the surface. And uh, particularly for the farmed truffles that I'm going to talk about next, that where an individual truffle can be worth hundreds of dollars, to have a claw mark in it is very damaging. So uh, the best dogs are trained to do something other than dig. So they sit or bark or point or something besides digging. And yeah, you, you do have to train them to do that. Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead and, and get back to the presentation. There's still a bunch of questions and we're going to continue those after the next segment. Um, and we go to 430, but actually we stay till 445 for overtime for Q&A. So uh, hang in there and why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit more uh, in the next part of your presentation. Sure. And my email address is at the end of the presentation. Just feel free to send your questions. So part two is um, the inoculated or the truffle farms, the, the orchards of inoculated trees. And the reason I mentioned this is just that it's really working, it's happening. We have, we don't just have our four native Oregon truffle species here in Oregon. We now have these European species growing in orchards. This is, this is really, really happening. Oregon right now has, uh, as many or more produ productive truffle orchards as any other state in the country. Uh, so this photo is hazelnuts here in the Lamont Valley. They're inoculated with the French black truffle, which uh, has the ability to kill the grass around the tree. And you can notice there's a little bear patch around every single one of those trees. Uh, so the truffle is absolutely thriving on their roots. So, the impetus to figure out how to grow truffles isn't, wasn't just because truffles were expensive, but also because over the past century, shown by this graph, truffle production in Europe has fallen kind of in an exponential curve. And there are a lot of reasons for this. Um, one of them may be that uh, if you were to plot this graph another hundred years in the past beyond this, you'd see the mirror image, which reflects the fact that phylloxera has killed all the grapes in Europe and all, all that land had gone fallow and was growing oak trees. And actually some people were planting oak trees for the purpose of growing truffles. So around uh, the beginning of the 20th century, truffle production reached an all time high and then declined ever, ever since. And uh, a few researchers in France and Italy in the late 1960s decided to do something about it to develop a, what they referred to as a rational method for 
cultivation of truffles, where they inoculated seedlings under controlled conditions in the greenhouse, then outplanted these trees. And it, I, it was in the earlier mid 1970s when the first of these inoculated trees began to produce truffles that proved the concept that you could grow truffles so in this kind of controlled way. The first farm that produced truffles outside of Europe was in Mendocino County, California, and the truffles began fruiting there in 1987. Uh, that proved the concept that you could now, using this method, grow truffles outside of their nat natural habitat. Uh, since then, the bulk of the, these French black truffles, Tour de Milan's form, are now grown on farms. It's a almost completely domesticated crop with about 90% of the production coming from inoculated trees. And they're grown all over the world in all the same kinds of climates where people tend to grow wine, uh, red wine grapes. So th this is the, how the inoculated seedlings look like. They're produced by the hundreds of thousands. Um, uh, just in the U.S., I'm guessing that, uh, that 200 acres are planted annually, and uh, this is the relationship between the fungus and the host tree. It forms ectomycorrhizae, so it looks like little corn dogs on the roots of the trees. These these corn dogs are maybe a tenth of a millimeter long. They're just barely visible with your na naked eye. Uh, this is hazelnuts again. This orchard happens to be in Tennessee, but that white dog, who is the grandfather of my dog Dante, uh, is finding a truffle right there. And he's scraped the top off of it. He's damaged this truffle, just like we were talking about. <laughs> and there's beautiful marbling inside. And here's the truffle pulled out of the ground. And the story with this individual truffle is that the next day we took this to a resort called Blackberry Farm. It's right next to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And the chefs there said, we need one to send to the White House. And this is the one they chose. <laughs> so that truffle was shipped to the White House the next day. Uh, the productive truffle orchards in the country are represented by these dots. Um, on the right, there's this legend with five different kinds of truffles, two of which are native species, Tuber leonii and Tuber canaliculatum. There are a couple of orchards where people are uh, have planted trees inoculated with these native truffle species, and it's working. Um, but otherwise, there are three European species. We have all three of them growing in the Northwest, uh, including eight farms in Oregon, I believe, at this point. And yeah, I said this is what we're aware of as of January 2020. And as of now, there are two more dots that I need to put on the map. So it's, it's really growing quickly. <coughs> and then finally, uh, a little plug for the Oregon Truffle Festival. This is our tool to redeem the native Oregon truffles. And when we have uh, cultivated European truffles growing in greater volumes in Oregon, we'll promote them too. So here's uh, our 2020 recap. We managed to just complete the festival before the pandemic hit. So 37 culinary events, 41 chefs, so on and so on. Uh, what's really great to me is when we get down to 67 truffle dogs, because when we started in 2006, there were none. There were no truffle dogs at all. And uh, I went out recruiting trainers. To, um, I took them into the woods, taught them about truffles until it, and I'd get them to like the sheriff with his drug dog or the search and rescue dogs. They'd come and do a, a demo at the festival. It took about three years, though, to find somebody who decided that truffle hunting was really what they wanted to do, at which point we were able to launch our truffle dog training seminar. And it just kind of spread. There are now several companies around the Northwest specializing in truffle dog training. Uh, so <clears throat> where there were none when we started 15 years later, there are probably a couple thousand truffle dogs in the Northwest. And then we served you know, well over 100 pounds of truffles, including 12 pounds of Paragord truffles. Uh, we conceive of the festival as an educational event where the education can be as simple as just tasting a truffle for the first time or tasting truffles serve very well. Uh, but we also have educational programs, including uh, the truffle dog training seminar I mentioned, uh, the truffle growers farm for truffle farmers, lots of truffle cooking classes. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we take people on truffle hunting excursions. And then, of course, there's the marketplace, which is a whole festival in itself, where, again, it's, it's like uh, teaching people to, how to incorporate truffles into products they already make. Um, and then the public gets to taste all these things. 
So the Truffle Dog Training is a two-day event. Uh, you can bring your dog. The first day is in the classroom, introducing the dog to the smell of truffles. Day two is in the field, and nearly all of the dogs find their first truffles in the field on that second day. Cooking demonstrations. Uh, we have you know hands in the food, formal cooking classes, but also just cooking demonstrations at the marketplace. This year with the pandemic, uh, I suspect we will be letting people sign up to receive an ingredient kit that you have in your kitchen. You can cook along with chefs. Uh, and of course the class will be virtual. Truffle hunting forays. We've taken many, many hundreds of people into the woods to find their first truffles. Uh, it's interesting because this takes place in January and February, which is kind of <laughs> not the time of year people want to come to Oregon and go out in the woods, but it's just a blast. People have a great time doing it. The Joriad is our uh, North American Truffle Dog Championship. The, the name Joriad comes from Jory Soil, so this competition is a celebration of our soil. Uh, it takes place in three different Competitions, the one where the truffles are hidden in this tray, the dog just needs to alert correctly. If, if they pass that test, you know, finding five targets among these 17 trays and alerting correctly on the ones that have the real targets. Then the next is called the arena hunt where truffle targets are buried in the sand of the arena. And there are a large number of them. And the competition is just to find five in, uh, and you're timed. So the top five finalists who find the five targets most quickly Advance to the field hunt, where it's uh, <laughs> uh, a, a real truffle patch, where nobody hid the truffles at all. And you know, there are maybe lots of truffles or very few truffles. It depends on the year. Uh, but it's one solid hour. And anybody who has trained dogs knows that to get a dog to focus and work for a, an hour straight is really hard. Um, so this is a this is an intense competition to really measure you know the dogs and the handlers real ability to find truffles one of the things the owner of the chihuahua a few years ago did right is she took the dog into the best part of the patch <laughs> uh, she knew what to look for to, to take the dog to the right place so it's definitely a team sport and then the growers forum lots of lecture series lots of very international audience nearly everybody who attends these events is from out of state uh, in the marketplace, we're not putting truffles in wine, but we are putting them in everything else, the cheese, the, even the uh, bakery items, all the meats. Uh, the tr truffles can be used in a lot of different ways, but they pair well with our Oregon wines. Um, we, we are processing, we're working through very large volumes of truffles. The thing to understand about truffles, this is kind of the key point, the value is in the aroma. The aroma is the value. And so these truffles that we're running through our coolers are giving off aroma and we can capture that aroma. And here's a really simple demonstration where we have white truffles around a bowl of whipping cream. And the aroma of the truffles is accumulating in that cream, adding value to it. So you can make truffled whipped cream with that or truffled anything that includes cream. So, uh, you know, if you have the truffle for a week, you can capture an entire week with aroma before you finally serve it. So this is something that everybody needs to understand about truffles. You can make everything in your refrigerator taste like truffles really quite easily, including the ice cream in the freezer. <laughs> uh, we're actually partnering with a couple of different companies to incorporate truffles in the products they already make. So Olympia Provisions does an Oregon Truffle Festival uh, salami. And Wolves and People Brewery in Newburgh does a truffle beer. And that's an interesting process. How do you get a fat soluble molecule into a water soluble situation and it's we do it in two steps the first is to infuse hazelnuts and then use those hazelnuts to make a hazelnut stout and then of course just the experience of truffles is part is kind of the main part of the education so all those culinary events the biggest of them has about 300 people it's just a, a gorgeous experience so we have these delicacies under our feet uh, probably the single best way to experience truffles for the first time is just in scrambled eggs or something simple like macaroni and cheese. Uh, they're pretty easy to use. So that's the end of part two. There's my contact information if you don't get your questions answered. And I'm ready to field some more. I think we have about 15 more minutes. Oh, yeah. And then chances are we can go into overtime if you're willing. Sure. Um, 
and if you might, then uh, go ahead and show the um, promotions for the next events. So we'll, uh, if you've got those okay. there. Okay. So anyone who wants that information, I hope you're grabbing it because I'm moving on. <laughs> well, you can go back to it. If I just want okay. to make sure we get that in before we dive into questions. So just wanted to let you know um, this Thursday evening, wildlife damage in Eastern Oregon trees uh, with our extension forester from Central Oregon, Thomas Stokely. And then um, another one, uh, our upcoming tree school online is the uh, replanting your forest after timber harvest on December 1st um, and also after wildfire because reforestation after fire is a, certainly an important topic right now. So those are upcoming programs. So if you want to go back get, to leave your uh, contact information okay. there, Charles, that'd be good. I know a lot of these programs look really interesting to me. All right, well, let's, let's plow forward. So this is going to be maybe lightning round because we've got 30 some questions. So let's, let's go for <laughs> it. Um, you may talk, well, what, what is the potential for commercially expanding the demand for truffles in the Northwest? Uh, is there currently unmet demand? That's an interesting question, uh, particularly with regard to the, the cultivated European truffles. There are very few restaurants in Oregon that use European truffles currently. But uh, so it, I think a lot of growers worry that they're going to have to be shipping their truffles to the big cities. The reality that we've observed is that we find latent demand among very local restaurants, including one orchard near Jacksonville. Um, they found a food cart that was willing to buy their entire crop, <laughs> a cart, food cart that didn't normally serve truffles at all. So, I, And this is true everywhere across the country. Nobody's having to ship their truffles anywhere yet. They're, they're able to just hand deliver them to very local restaurants. So there's this, a great deal of latent demand in that form. Um, certainly in the Northwest, all of the local chefs are aware of the Oregon truffles and they've, um, many of them unfortunately have developed a negative opinion of them because what they've experienced is the rake truffles that really aren't very good. Uh, so there are a lot of chefs where you have to overcome that bad experience. And that's kind of true everywhere across the country also. Um, you know, chefs are curious about a, a new kind of truffle. Uh, so a lot of people have been kind of burned on the raked Oregon truffles. Uh, so there's a bit of a learning curve. Uh, getting them to see the dog harvested truffles is a fundamentally different product. It's really world class. Um, and then, of course, there are new chefs coming along. So um, there is definitely a need to grow demand. Uh, but the, I would say the supply is growing slower than the demand is, which is, means that the prices are have stayed high for the dog harvested Oregon truffles. So related to that, how do you find buyers? Uh, well, all the same ways you find buyers to buy anything. <laughs> Lots of social media, websites, um, just people calling restaurants. Really, the, one of the best ways to sell truffles is just to show up at the restaurant with a basket full of them. Uh, there's one funny story at Blackberry Farm in East Tennessee, which is a very, very high-end restaurant. A colleague of mine, who actually did his PhD on truffle cultivation at Oregon State University, finally got a crop of his own. Uh, that was that photo I showed you where they're finding the truffles that were sent to the White House. So he goes to the back of the restaurant with a basket of truffles and not being in the restaurant business, he didn't know that you, you don't do that on a busy Friday night. <laughs> but one of the chefs wrote a blog entry that said, this guy shows up on the back porch with a basket of truffles and all activity in the kitchen ceased. <laughs> they were so excited and of course bought everything he grew for the next several years. Um, and that was my experience in graduate school when I was harvesting truffles to trade food, no, to trade for meals at restaurants. Um, just showing up at the back door of the restaurant was a great way to sell them. Wow. Um, so how does someone without private land get access to private land if you don't know any landowners? You have to be brave and go introduce yourself to strangers. Uh, you, I've done this many times. You drive up to the door of somebody who has appears to have some habitat, and um, I've been received warmly, and I've been run off. <laughs> so uh, it's it's helpful to go as a pair. <laughs> and uh, there are tricks that I use, like to wear something that looks like a uniform. <laughs> 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 well, that could get you run off too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, depending on the uniform. So um, um, how do you seed a new planting with truffles? How do you inoculate? So with the cultivated European truffles, that's all done in a greenhouse. It's done under controlled conditions. Uh, in the field, 
uh, there has been no good research on that question. How do you introduce truffles to a stand of trees? The most reliable method I, can, I know of is to plant your trees adjacent to an existing truffle patch. And that's a, that's a sure thing. The, tr the truffles will definitely find their way in. Uh, but then actually I am going to be planting four acres of Douglas fir here in the next year or two. And we'll need to figure this out. How do I introduce truffles into that stand? And people have come up with all sorts of ideas like feed the truffles to pigs and let the pigs roam around the, in the stand of trees. Um, I, I suspect it's a simpler process than that. The question is just um, how old do the trees need to be before they become receptive to the truffle? And it's, uh, it's difficult to produce the seedlings, uh, inoculated Douglas for seedlings in the nursery, I suspect, because the trees are not able to produce enough for, to support the truffle mycorrhizae. So this, I, I think it's going to be sometime later when you're able to introduce the spores and have them successfully germinate. But um, nobody's done that like a cutting edge um, research and development still going on. Yeah. Um, might you find truffles in the year following the death of a tree? Oh, I suspect not unless that truffle had already formed. Um, yeah, no, the, the truffle mycorrhizae die very quickly when the host tree dies. Okay. Um, can biochar be used to improve yield of truffles? Uh, you know, there are truffle orchards around the world that are testing that idea. There's one in California, and there's actually a truffle company in Australia called Terra Preta Truffles. <laughs> so presumably they are including biochar in their, in their soil. But uh, I have not seen any published studies. All right. Um, real quick, I'm going to put up another poll. Uh, just want to, before we lose too many folks from the audience, um, just going to try a wrap up poll and just answer the questions as you have a chance. Um, and we're not going to talk about it, but if you would just give us your opinion about, about this webinar. And I'll go ahead and put that aside and keep asking questions and answer the poll at your liberty there. Um, so thank you for this. Uh, I've heard it's possible to purchase inoculated trees, hazelnut and oak. Are there local suppliers that will sell just a few or can you inoculate established trees? So it sounds like the hazelnut and oak uh, situation. Right. So yes, that's how I make my living. Um, <laughs> so you can come to me uh, to buy trees. Our, my company is a wholesale company though. Our minimum order is 75 trees. However, we do sell trees to territorial seed company for them to retail by the each. And that is specifically English oak trees inoculated with the Bianchetto truffle. And we chose the Bianchetto because it is the truffle species that's most likely to fruit when you just have one or two or three trees. Uh, some of the other truffles are much less likely to fruit. And I, I kind of feel it would be unethical to sell one or two trees when I think the likelihood of success is so low. Okay. Um, and then reg regarding inoculating existing trees, there is yeah. some research that has been done, but I think it's not cost effective. Okay. So best to be planting inoculated seeds <laughs> with that yeah. hazelnut and oak. Um, details about how the fir tree is the host. What is the tree providing if the truffles reproducing via spores, uh, depending on animals for regeneration? So sounds like clarification needed there. Sure. So uh, truffles are an e ectomycorrhizal fungus, which means that they receive all of their energy from the host tree. The host tree produces uh, sugars through photosynthesis that it passes on to the truffle. That's their sole source of energy. Uh, the truffle in turn is exploring the soil, harvesting mineral nutrients that it passes on to the tree. So this is a mutually beneficial association. Uh, if you kill the tree, you're also killing the truffle because you're cutting it off from its energy source. Excellent. The truffles that we're harvesting are just the fruiting body of this, uh, this larger vegetative structure on the roots. Um, is there a relationship only with Douglas firs? No. <laughs> Our native truffles are all most abundant under Douglas fir. The black truffles and brown truffles, I'm not, I'm not aware that they've ever been found under any other kind of tree, except in France, <laughs> where the black truffles fruit with pines. The winter and spring white truffles have been observed under noble fir, 
grand fir, and interestingly, Diodor cedar. But it's it's unusual. Um, does a truffle ripen after it's been harvested? Yes, if it's mature enough. Uh, and you can determine that by the color of the interior. The, the spores are very dark. So if the interior is white, that means the spores are not mature and the truffle probably will not ripen. But if it's at least some shade of brown, then it will ri ripen. Uh, but like a tomato, it just won't be the same as one that's ripened naturally in the ground. Yeah, I guess follow up. So how do you tell that the truffle is ripe? It has aroma. Each individual truffle should have a very powerful, distinctive, unmistakable aroma. Where uh, what often happens with the raked truffles is that you open the bag or the box and it smells like truffles, but it's just one or two that are doing all the work and the rest have no aroma. So you have to smell each individual truffle. They should all have powerful aroma. So that's how ripe is defined. It's just the presence of aroma as opposed to mature, which is just means the capacity to produce aroma. What's a common arrangement with a private landowner for splitting the goods for the right to access their land? 50-50, uh, uh, how would that work? Uh, in my experience, it ranges anywhere from 10% of royalties to 25%, but um, you know, there are a lot of people that just want to harvest truffles for fun and they're, I uh, think, <laughs> um, it might just be a flat fee or it might just be, sure, go harvest truffles, have fun. <laughs> and leave um, the landowner a, a bag of truffles. I've, yeah, I've done that many times. <laughs> uh, I would say a typical harvest arrangement would be 15 to 20% royalties, but it depends on how good the patch is. If it's kind of a lean patch without much in it and you're having to work really hard, then it's painful to give somebody a 20% royalty. Uh, so it kind of depends on how good the patch is. And then also, some of the landowners don't really like the honor system approach where you're paying a royalty. They just want a flat fee. Okay. So you just negotiate with, with the yeah. landowner. How does the dog tell you that there's a truffle? Uh, do the dogs dig up the truffle? Oh, uh, you get to know your dog really well. You can, you know, just immediately when the dog's head jerks around that they've found the truffle. And it's, it's fascinating to watch because literally they will sometimes... Uh, wander a hundred feet before they finally find it. Uh, so you're watching the dog's body language. And sometimes it couldn't be more obvious. They're just digging a hole going after this truffle. Um, I had an experience last spring where the dogs just kept digging and digging and digging. It took half an hour and both dogs to dig a hole that was two and a half feet deep before they finally came to a truffle the size of a dime. So you kind of have to have some faith in your dog too, that they're digging for a truffle and not for a mouse. Um, so you, you tend to see different body languages between looking for a mouse and looking for a truffle that you mm. come to recognize. So then how do you remove the truffle from the ground if uh, you're not raking or if you don't let the dog dig it all the way out? That can be hard with a little truffle. Uh, you could end up digging a big hole and never finding it. It's just, you know, somewhere in the tailings. It's so the, one of the things, one of the actual, the harder things to teach the dog is to point at the truffle. To, so you're digging and you're not finding it. So you ask the dog to come back and check the hole. And often they will find the truffle in the tailings or they'll tell you that the, you need to keep digging. Uh, it just, it's a relationship with the dog. The dogs become very good at it. Although th there is a character trait in dogs that I think is very valuable, which is the dog ability to just put its nose on the truffle. But there are many dogs who can point them out that way. Yeah, that gives you a chance to get it before they eat it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, how about soils? If there's a high water table in the soil, is that bad or good? Or high productivity timber soil versus low? Sure. And it differs for the different truffle species. So the white truffles, generally speaking, are most abundant on our red soils. Uh, so the Jory, Nekia, all those soils. Um, even like the Willikensee soils that are so great for wine grapes, at least upland soils, uh, well, you don't tend to find black truffles so much. You do find some, but not as many. Where the black truffles become more abundant is on the black soils. So imagine the most desirable soil for your garden. That's where the black truffles tend to live. And I think they have some role in creating that soil. So as you're walking through a, a patch, you sometimes notice that the ground becomes noticeably softer. 
and you're, you kind of sink into it just with your feet. That's the kind of situation the black truffle is like. Very good. Uh, and they do live with each other, but they don't tend, you know, the, the black, in a black rich soil, the black truffles tend to take over. Might I expect to find truffles in my 33 year old reproduction forest in Columbia County near Vernonia? <laughs> oh, and, and high water table is bad for trees. If you have an unhealthy tree, you can't have truffles. Um, if the water table is high enough. Around Vernonia, there are truffles all around there. That's it's really, that's, that is great truffle country. All but if it's there. reproduction, uh, uh, reforestation, rather than on a ah. pasture land, there's that part of it too. Well, I think it, it's close to perfect certainty that there are some truffles. So the question is only how much. Um, if, if there are stumps and logs on the ground and a lot of residue from the previous forest, you don't tend to find very many truffles under those circumstances, unless it for what happened to be broadcast burned, and then you can. Or if the stand had been dominated by alder trees before it was replaced with Douglas fir, that's another situation where the black truffles can thrive. Oh, okay. That's good to know. Um, so we are at 4.30, and uh, we're going to continue with the uh, uh, overtime questions because there's still lots of questions, but I just want to thank everyone for joining us, and thank you, Charles. Uh, for this excellent presentation, um, but we're going to keep going. Um, so, um, is it possible to find truffles around the Willamette River in Eugene? Ah, yes, absolutely. Uh, in fact, I have. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, the, you can find wherever there's Douglas fir. So, if there's Douglas fir in the riparian area, yes, there there may be truffles. All right. Um, and will the truffles grow around wild filbert trees, the brush hazel? Uh, no, uh, I've never found a tuber species under our wild hazelnut trees. There may be some, I just haven't ever found them. Uh, certainly you wouldn't find the European truffles if those trees had not been inoculated in the nursery. And our native Oregon truffles all live with Douglas fir. There are many other truffles though, and there are other truffles associated with hardwoods. So I suppose it's possible to find them under the, 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 a wild hazelnut. I just haven't experienced it yet. Is, is there any risk that the European truffles would outcompete and replace native truffles? And become, yeah, that's a question that comes up. Um, how much potential they have to be invasive. And I think it varies for the different kinds of truffles. The species that most people are trying to grow uh, evolved in a limestone bedrock and you know the, the very calcareous soil with a soil pH typically around eight and we soils like that just simply don't exist and certainly in the west side of the Cascades um, so in order to grow these truffles we have to add tremendous volumes of lime to raise the soil pH which creates an island of habitat where the European truffles can live but it creates a, a competitive disadvantage for our native species um, so it's very likely that the European truffles are not going to escape from that island of habitat. There are exceptions though, and in fact, uh, a Chinese truffle was found in the McDonald Dunn forest just north of Corvallis, who knows how it got there. Um, and the Bianchetto truffle seems to live, can, can tolerate a lower soil, soil pH, and it was actually found living in an arboretum in Massachusetts uh, a few years ago. So I, there is clearly, oh, and there's also one European species that's invasive all over the world. And we have found it uh, contaminating our orchards, presumably coming from the surrounding woods. So sure, yeah, truffles can be invasive like other things can. Okay. Um, have you known anyone to use herding breeds of dogs for truffle hunting? Uh, this person has a six month old uh, red healer shepherd that he'd like to train, she'd like to train. Certainly German shepherds are very common among truffle dogs. Um, and I've seen a number of uh, definitely Australian shepherds and border collies, but I would suggest that a lot of those dogs may not be the best truffle dogs just because for one, they're so visual. And the second, they're just so sort of naturally prone to chase other animals, which represents a powerful distraction. So while yes, they can do it, I think um, they're less likely to be really good truffle dogs. Okay. Um what would the cost be to have your land surveyed for truffles? Um, 
What, well, that, what, yeah. that, that depends on a lot of things, like how far the surveyor has to travel to get there uh, and how big the area is that they're surveying. Um, so just generally speaking, if it takes the person half a day, it's just a person's half a day wages. They, um, but plus you're also paying it's for the dog. <laughs> so it, it's typically, I say $200. I don't know. It, would, it varies a lot. Okay. All right. Um, and I think you've, you kind of touched on this. Can a homeowner successfully grow truffles uh, in their backyard with a few inoculated trees? Um, it can be done. It has been done. There, there was a big uh, um, media explosion a couple of years ago when somebody found a French Perigord truffle in a rooftop garden in a planter. <laughs> so clearly it's just living on an, an isolated tree. Uh, so yes, it can be done, but I think the Bianchetto truffle is the best species to try it with, or our native truffles under Douglas fir. I know many people who have Douglas or our native Oregon truffles in their backyards. Okay. Um, there was a picture of truffles stored with paper towels. Um, mm -hmm. So are those moist or dry towels and maybe more about storing truffles, I guess? You know, there's a, um, we just launched a new website for the Oregon Truffle Festival, and there's really a great description on the care and handling of truffles. And it's, it's tricky, particularly with the Oregon black truffles. They need to be cleaned and trimmed and blotted dry immediately out of the field and then immediately put in the refrigerator. And if you do all that well, then the truffles really come to life. They, it's just amazing. But if you neglect that, if you leave them dirty or leave uh, any of the damaged spots on them, they'll spoil overnight. So the storage con handling conditions are just critical. Um, typically, we're putting them in a, a in a container lined with something like a paper towel to wick excess moisture off of the truffle. But the container is big. It's mostly air. The truffles are just in a single layer on the bottom. And you have to provide fresh air to the container at least once a day or have the perforations in the container so that oxygen can get in. The truffle is alive and it's breathing and it only continues to give off aroma as long as it remains alive. So the paper towel is there to, to prevent moisture from accumulating on the surface of the truffle and you're changing it out as it becomes soaked. Okay. Um, are there harvestable truffles in the Cascade foothills, let's say just the native forest? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, there are. <laughs> Uh, so say Eastern Marion County is one of the areas that has been very, very productive of both white and black truffles over the years. How about up the Mackenzie or the Southern uh, Willamette Valley Cascades? Definitely. Okay. Uh, there's maybe less optimal habitat up the Mackenzie, but it definitely exists. All right. Um, what about competition between other mycorrhizal fungi species? Um, you know, do the do the organ truffles defeat or the culinary truffles defeat others or get defeated, coexist? Uh, one thing that seems to be true of the truffles in general is they tend to be dominant competitors. So with regard to say the French black truffle, it's typical to see that truffle occupy nearly all of the roots on the tree. Uh, the same was true with the Oregon white truffles. Um, so these, these, Truffles are, uh, at least say the Oregon truffles are specialists on a certain host tree. So they become very good at living with that tree, very well adapted to it. Um, but there will always be some other things. There are some ubiquitous mycorrhizae in the soil. Like I referred to that, that puff ball with a purple interior. Uh, that's very, very common. Um, it's a, a generalist fungi, fungus that just lives on young trees in disturbed sites, and you tend to always find them in truffle orchards. We've been talking mostly about hazelnut or Douglas fir trees. What about native Oregon oaks here in the Willamette Valley? As it happens, uh, we've been experimenting with our native Quercus gariana for the past three years, and I'm delighted to say that it's really working. We're, we are able to grow Quercus gariana in a soil pH close to eight, and the truffle fungus is perfectly happy on its roots. So I'm very excited. I think we can do this. I mean, we're certainly using native species from elsewhere in North America. The Valley Oak in California is performing very well. The California Black Oak is performing well. Uh, Burr Oak and Chinkapin Oak from the East Coast. 
Um, so I, I'm delighted that yes, Quercus Gariana is definitely a good host for truffles. And that's so, with the European truffles? With the European truffles, yes. And, uh, Inoculating you know, seedlings? Yeah. Okay. It's the, the kind of thing where you can, um, you know, these trees are performing other ecosystem services in addition to producing truffles. So uh, the truffle farming is, you know, you can actually be doing some work for the environment at the same time that you're making a living from your, your orchard. Okay. Um, are truffles always underground? No. <laughs> in fact, uh, it's very common to find them bulging out of the ground. If you're in a very rich patch, it's not uncommon to find them up in trees where a squirrel has left them. Um, so no, I, in fact, many truffle orchard owners the, find their first truffle just poking its head above the ground. Can you freeze truffles? You can, but the, the way to think of a truffle is a little aroma factory and freezing it kills it. So it stops making aroma and all the aroma that remains is whatever happened to be in it at that time. So a frozen truffle is kind of a pale shadow of a fresh truffle. Uh, also, there's this phenomenon where truffles don't smell like mushrooms normally, but if you macerate them or freeze them, suddenly they start producing mushroom aroma and it really comes through in the food. And I, you can always tell a frozen truffle from a fresh truffle. I think it's much better to capture the aroma in something else and then use the truffle as an oculum. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Um, what about undergrowth? Uh, does the ground under the first Douglas fir need to be clear brush um, or, you know, what's the relation with undergrowth? Uh, there are definitely associations. So it's all of the harvesters notice that black truffles tend to really thrive in places where there are sword ferns. And often the truffle will be right, right at the base of the sword fern plant. That's very common, commonly observed. There's unlikely to be any kind of direct connection between them, but possibly there is. Um, other things like that are native hazelnuts um, can be common in truffle patches, the, the wild cucumbers. So there are plants to look for, um, but they're, I think, likely just kind of all living in the same kind of habitat rather than having any kind of direct association. Okay. Uh, quickly, I mentioned there was a question about will there be other mushroom hunting Zoom classes available? Uh, I, we're not planning any for tree school. Um, but any recommendations about that, Charles? Uh, uh, we, where to learn about mushroom hunting? I uh, volunteered to do a, a truffle dog training class. Uh, that's not on the schedule yet. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, it might be a little bit difficult to teach people about mushroom identification with an online class. Yeah. Okay. Uh, might get in touch with the local mycological society and go to a meeting or something someday when they yeah. meet again. I, I should say that the Mount Pisgah Arboretum did a wonderful uh, mushroom show this past October and all of that is online. So if you go to the Arboretum website, there actually were some good sections on identification of mushrooms. Yeah. And I just want to confirm that, you know, folks can contact you, Charles, if they have more questions, because we're not going to get to all of them today. Right. Yeah. Please okay. Feel free. Yeah. Uh, what's the best method to clean truffles? Uh, I use a high pressure, low volume jet of water. So I just use a nozzle on my hose and get just blast the dirt off that way rather than scrubbing it. Uh, just blast the dirt off. And then it's, there's always going to be some little bits of dirt that stick on more tightly and you have to individually pick those off. And there are sometimes deep crevices that are hard to clean but just just water that's all all right and what's the best way to restore the hole where you dug the truffle up do you just uh, just fill it back in with just take the tailings that you dug out and put them back in the hole okay uh any relationship with where truffles grow and the calypso orchids oh interesting you know, so, because that's another symbiotic uh, relationship there underground i guess sure. you know uh I'm very familiar with the Calypso orchids, but I don't tend to see them in the same kinds of places. Where you um, find truffles, huh? Yeah, I, I can't think of, of an example. I'm sure there's some overlap. I just haven't observed it. What about uh, relationships with Pacific Madrone? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, Pacific Madrone has the 
characteristic that it's broadly receptive to mycorrhizal fungi. So uh, madrone and chinkapin in particular, when you find those two species together, that's a great place to look for mushrooms. There are, there are all kinds of really great mushrooms, the queen bolides, matsutake, yellowfoot chanterelles, all kinds of things. That's, so madrones are a good tree to look for. <laughs> um, I am actually quite interested in testing the compatibility of madrones with the European truffle species, but the, I don't think the Oregon truffle species would live with them. All right. Well, uh, do, do elk and deer eat truffles? Last question. <laughs> yes, nearly everything eats truffles, uh, except those things that eat nothing but meat. So nearly all the animals in the forest that eat more than just meat will eat truffles. All right. Well, we're at 445, and we have to call this to a close. And Charles, thank you so much for sticking with us and all of your sharing all your great knowledge and, and questions. And My pleasure. And uh, again, I invite folks to contact Charles and uh, check out the Oregon Truffle Festival. And look, we'll try to come up with a truffle dog class someday in the future. That would be fun. Oh, thanks again, Charles. Yep, thank you, everyone. <laughs>